Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. No matter how you're watching or where you're watching, we are so excited you decided to join us today. I want to encourage you to do the best you can to pause the distractions and go all in with us over the next few minutes as we worship and grow in God's word together. We believe God wants to connect with each and every person who's watching in a very special way. We're about to spend some time in worship together, but before we do, parents, we want to remind you that your kids have their very own online service today as well. You'll see that link being posted in the online chat. Now let's turn our hearts toward heaven as we spend some time worshiping and singing together. All right, wherever you are, let's lift up the name of Jesus together. Come on.
Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. And I wanted to jump in front of the camera before we get to today's content, today's teaching, and first of all, welcome you and remind you of all the ways you could stay connected during this time where we're still not able to gather in person. So don't forget, our small groups are still going on. You can check those out through the True Life Church website or through the app. Uh, you can still stay connected to us through social media, and you could download that app on your smartphone or smart device. Just search for True Life Church of Newark in your favorite uh, app store. So here's the deal. You might be tuning into church today expecting to hear a message that speaks directly to what's going on in our country right now. And while I think today's message absolutely applies, I need you to understand why it doesn't speak directly to what's going on, and it's because of our taping schedule at church right now, uh, so that our team has plenty of time to get everything in place for our Sunday services online. We actually record the messages 10 days ahead of time. So what you're about to hear happened last Thursday. So here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you to hang around at the very end of the message today. I'm going to come back on the screen and just share a couple brief thoughts with you and let you know how we're responding as a church and how we're going to resource you, equip you, and lead you during this season that we find ourselves in. So sit back, relax, enjoy the message. I think it's gonna encourage you, and then I'll see you for a couple minutes at the very end. Here we go. Welcome to Church Online and week one of a brand new series called New Normal. No matter where you're at or how you found us, we are so thrilled that you're spending time with us today and gathering with us online for church and so excited to get into some new content with you. And I know every single week we hear of new people who are finding us for the very first time. Maybe a friend or family member told you about us. Maybe you just happen to see it on social media or our YouTube channel and so you're watching Church Online today. And so I just want to say hello to you if you're a guest and say thank you so much for joining us and spending time with us today as we gather for church together. Uh, before I get into the content, I want to just talk a little bit about what's coming. In fact, maybe you're noticing right now this looks a little different than the last several weeks of church. Can you believe it's been over two months now uh, since all of this began? I remember the feelings that we had when uh, coronavirus started to hit the news and we realized that our lives were going to be impacted by this. And even when we decided to do church at home in the early weeks of this and just kind of that feeling of, well, this will ha last for a couple weeks and things will get right back to normal. And I don't know, you maybe even remember in the news, in the news cycle, it was 15 days to slow the spread. Do you remember that? And then 15 days turned to 30 and now it's two and a half months Later, it'll be, uh, by the time we're gathering in person again, it'll be probably over three months uh, since all of this began. And our lives have been impacted, uh, all of our lives, the whole world. My, my seven-year-old son gets this concept. He said to me the other day, Daddy, like, coronavirus happened and the whole world changed. And it did. And we're all dealing with this new normal, this new normal that we live in. But reopening has begun in different parts of the country. The conversation has happened. Even here in Delaware, I, I'm taping this on a Thursday night. And by the time we all gather for church and watch this message, it'll actually be 10 days after I tape it. And we'll officially be in phase one of reopening here in our state. And how exciting is that? And it was so much fun to come into our building tonight and record this message for you and see our worship band back playing together and so we're, we're taking baby steps, and so we had people on the stage again. That was so refreshing. It's kind of fun for me to be here, and uh, I've even got my wife and daughter who I get to preach to in the auditorium with me, and uh, some people manning the cameras. It's like, it's so nice to just see some, some other human bodies uh, in the building. I know a lot of you are asking, when are we going to worship together again? When is that going to happen? And um, I, the truth is, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we will be 
having conversations with all of our leaders and coaches and directors, all of our dream team leadership over the next couple of weeks. And if I had to give you a date, and I know this is dangerous, but if I had to, like if my gut, if I had to give you a date, I would say it's probably going to be July 19th. Um, in fact, some of the churches that we learn a lot from who are in uh, different parts of the country that are reopening, uh, they're about a month ahead of us on the schedule, and they'll reopen um, about four weeks prior to that. And so that seems like that's probably about the right time. And what you're seeing on the broadcast today and uh, some of the different camera angles and different things like that are, are part of the things that our team has been working hard on so that when we do come back live, for those of you who aren't ready or, or maybe you're more high risk and, and you need to be more careful being around crowds, we're going to do the very best we can to deliver an excellent online church experience to you at home. And I'm so proud of our team and all of the hard work and the countless hours that have gone into that. So pray for us as we navigate all of this. Don't hold us to it just yet. But July 19th is what we're kind of looking at. And I don't actually want to say to, um, and I don't know if he'll ever see it or if any of the leadership will ever see it, but I, myself and a, a handful of other faith leaders, pastors in our state, we're asking for our state government to give some guidance specifically to churches and, and tell us, because we're pastors and uh, we do church well, but we're not public health professionals. And so we kind of said like, hey, give us specific guidance because we have some unique things going on here. And uh, they, they tried at first and then tweaked it and it's gotten better. But the fact that they even did that, I appreciate. And I can't imagine being in public service right now. And I know there's a lot of political opinions on both sides of this. I have some of my own and I don't agree with every decision that gets made. But we just want to give a little bit of honor to our state government leadership and our governor, John Carney, thank you for uh, paying attention to us. And uh, thank you that all through coronavirus, churches in Delaware have been listed as an essential business. And we needed to regulate our crowd size, and we would have done that anyway because we want to be good neighbors. Uh, but I want to just say thank you and give a little honor uh, on that front. So let me give you our theme passage for this series. We started with this last week, and here's a little secret It'll kind, of, it'll kind of mess us up. I'll probably take away the magic of the moment a little bit. But for me, for you, you're watching this seven days after part one of this series. For me, I'm preaching it just a little over 24 hours after I preached part one of the series. And so for me, it was yesterday. For you, it was seven days ago. You saw this verse for the first time as the theme passage for this series. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace. He's the God of peace. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. And that's what we're going to work on during this series. Last week was about your spirit. Today we're going to talk about the soul. Next week we're going to talk about the body. Be, may they be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Let me pray for you as we get into this today. Heavenly Father, thank you for every person that's watching, no matter where they're at, no matter what screen they're using. And I just pray that you'd help the words that you've given me to share in this message to connect, that would connect on a heart level, that you would anoint it and that you would use it to change our lives and make us more like you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, check it out. As, we, as we've progressed through this new normal, there's a whole lot that has changed. But there are some things that have not changed. There are some things that have actually stayed the same. Uh, uh, four of them, in fact, that for us as a church, uh, we still believe are God's plan, God's will, the vision he's given us, the, the vision he has for every person to experience in their lives. Four things that we still think he wants you to experience. And that is, number one, that you would know him, that you would have a relationship with him. In fact, I think you're going to need all four of these things if you can get through this new normal that we're living through right now and come out on the other side and st have, still, still be healthy. You, you're going to need to know God first and foremost. And here's something cool that we probably haven't talked about enough is almost every single week we see people making decisions to follow Jesus in our online services. And uh, we see lives being changed in our online services. And, and uh, we're so thankful that we get to be a part of that kind of transformation in people's lives. And every single one of us needs to have a relationship with Jesus. It starts with knowing God. Then we need to find freedom and discover purpose. 
We need to find freedom from uh, our past and our junk. And here at True Life, we do that primarily through small groups. And I know that's been a little bit different right now. Uh, I, I know that at the same time I'm taping this message, all of our small group leaders are gathered on a, a video conference call to talk about the summer and how to keep people connected and help people continue to find freedom. And I just want to give a shout out to Pastor Joel and to all of our small group leaders and say thank you. Thank you for all of the hard work you've done, continuing with freedom classes and all of our small group curriculums and uh, continuing to find ways to, to gather and connect and share with one another and encourage each other during this uh, just difficult season that we find ourselves in. And we still need to discover purpose here at True Life. We do that through a, a system called Life Track, And kind of behind the scenes, we've been trying to figure out how do we offer Life Track online. We've actually leveraged this time to get better at a lot of things. One of the things that we did is we refilmed all of our Life Track classes. We've got them all, all brand new content for Life Track that is filmed right now and, and working through the process of post-production. And, and we're trying to figure out how we can deliver that to you digitally so that you can still continue on this track that God has for you to know Him, to find freedom, to figure out what your calling is what God wants to do with your life, and we'll talk more about that later in the message, so that all of us can make a difference. And we think this is the best version of life there is, where you start to live your life for something bigger than yourself. And so many of you have been finding unique ways to do that during this time, and I want to say thank you for that. You know, Dream Team, you don't stop being Dream Team just because we can't do it in this building. You're still Dream Team, and we still serve and we still look for opportunities to make a difference in the lives of other people on behalf of our Lord. And I want to thank you for doing that. We need these things in our life so that we can be soul healthy. So that we can come out of this new, on the other side of this new normal, and hopefully still be okay. You know, everybody knows at this point what coronavirus does to our body. And there's, there's been a lot of work done. There's been a lot of guidelines. There's been a lot of rules. There's been a lot of restrictions to try to protect our body. But I'm going to tell you what I believe with all of my heart is that when we come out of the other side of this thing, we are going to have severely underestimated what coronavirus has done to our soul. Because people are lonely. People are isolated. People are going through uh, things in their life that they've never experienced before. Some have lost a loved one unexpectedly. Some have lost a job or an income unexpectedly. I saw a statistic just today that 55% of Americans who have children in their homes have lost at least some of their income due to the quarantine, due to lockdown. It's terrible. And I think when we come out of the other side of this, pastors are going to have to be ready to work hard. Counselors are going to be busier than ever. Because I think we've grossly underestimated the effect of coronavirus on the soul. We've done a lot to try to save the body. We haven't done very much to try to save the soul. And I'm worried about that. And so I want to try to help you today understand what happens to us in a season like the one we're in right now so that you can try to hold on to some emotional health. So you can try to have some emotional stability as we get closer to the end of this thing. So let me, let me show you just a, a pattern. In fact, secular psychologists would tell you this pattern. They would, they would break it down a lot more than I'm going to break it down in this message because I don't have time. But let me give you just three steps that we can take if we're not careful, they'll lead us to a place of emotional unhealth. And I want to help you know what they are so you can see them come and you can guard against them. And then at the end of the message, I'm going to give you a, a way to kind of build yourself up out of it. All right? Here's the first thing that happens. It starts with experiencing shock. There's a shock. There's a shock to our system. There's a shock to our way of life. I was thinking about my my son even, and the impact that this has had on him. My wife and I were talking about recently how he was, he's just this extreme extrovert, and he's got this crew of boys that he runs with at school. And we think he might be one of the ringleaders. We're, we're not 100% sure, but he just, he's got his, his buddies, and overnight, gone. 
He lost it. He's not going to get it back this school year. There may be a chance he doesn't get it back right at the beginning of next fall. We don't, we don't know what that looks like yet. That's a shock. There's a shock. It's a shock to our system. I've spent a lot of time talking to other pastors, and you can say what you want about it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, a healthy thing or an unhealthy thing. But in some regard, one of the, one of the things that helps us get through our life is knowing that once a week, hopefully, we get to stand in front of some people that we share some mutual love with and have some interaction and talk back and forth. And for me, honestly, this week's probably been one of the hardest ones of just kind of going, I'm really kind of tired of that. It's gone. There's a shock. There's a shock to our system. We, we, we're, we're trying to figure out how do I deal with this sudden change. It's disorienting. And here's the problem with shock is when we're in a, a season of shock and we're going, is this real? Is this really happening? What's going on right now? Our emotions can take over and it becomes impossible to see things the way they really are. You don't see things right and you start being led by your emotions and your impulses. It can actually be very dangerous when our emotions are ruling. And I I just want to help you process this a little bit. I want to help you see, first and foremost, there's a word that we really probably should stop using. You know, we, we keep saying about this, this season that we're in right now that, that there's never been anything like this, that this is unprecedented. And, and I realize that in our lifetime, that is true. But the truth is, within recent history, and if you look at the history of the world, recent history would just be the last couple hundred of years. And in, in the last couple hundred years, there have been multiple, multiple pandemics, multiple disease outbreaks, and I know some won't like hearing this, but the truth is, in many cases, the numbers were much worse than where we're going to end up from coronavirus. Much, much worse. So for, for us in our lifetime, we've, we've never experienced anything like this, but the fact is, this is, not, this is not unprecedented. This has happened before. In fact, uh, during uh, the summer of 1854, there was an outbreak of, of what's called cholera in London. It was a Uh, something that would get into the water supply and people would drink the water and it was making people sick. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people lost their lives very, very quickly. It It was incredible how quickly this sickness spread throughout London. And that same time that that was happening, there was a preacher who now is famous. He's He's, what they, he's, he's known as the Prince of Preachers. His name is Charles Spurgeon. I, when, my, when my dad passed away, he left a whole bunch of books and study books and different things. And, and uh, I don't have a lot of those anymore because most of them I can get digitally. But one of the ones I still hang on to that's on the shelf in my basement is, is a series of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. He was one of the most uh, detailed and effective orators and communicators of his, of his time. And... Um, he was trying to lead and pastor through this, and it started to get to him, this pandemic that he was going through. And he said this, he said, I became weary in body and sick at heart. My friends seemed falling one by one, and I felt or fancied that I was sickening like those around me. How, how many of us, <laughs> you had just a little runny nose or a little tickle in your throat, and you thought, is this? Is it coming for me? Is it corona? And that's what he was feeling. I felt that my burden was heavier than I could bear, and I was ready to sink under it. It was crushing him. And it was becoming difficult for him to lead and pastor. The story goes he was walking home from one of the funerals that he was doing. In fact, the, the They say that at one point it was so bad that Charles Spurgeon was doing at least a funeral every day. One funeral a day for weeks. And he was walking home feeling this way and he happened to look up and see a passage of scripture hanging in the window of a a shoemaker's shop. And it it was this passage. And we're going to read it in the King James because that's what he would have read it in back then. It says, because thou hast made the Lord, and this is, King James Version way of saying, because God, because you made, you made it, you made my refuge. Thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge. You made the place of my refuge, God. 
Even the most high, thy habitation. You've given me eternity. Heaven is my home. There shall be no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And Charles Spurgeon saw that passage of scripture and something happened in his heart. Something happened inside of him. It changed him. And he said this. He said, I read that passage and the effect upon my heart was immediate. Faith appropriated the passage as her own. I felt secure, refreshed, girt with immortality. Isn't that funny how they talk by then? I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. I felt no fear of evil, and I suffered no harm. That moment of connecting with God's word and being reminded of the truth snapped him out of shock, pulled him, pulled, and helped him remember God, God's in control, and he's got this. Some of us are dealing with shock right now, and I need to get you back to Jesus. Maybe it's the shock of lost income, or maybe a family member who got sick and, and lost their life because of this. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is for you. But if we don't handle shock correctly, it will lead us to another place. And that's when we begin to feel sorrow. And sorrow is a normal human emotion. Shock is an emotion God never feels. He's never surprised by anything. That's unique to humanity. But sorrow is one God actually can relate to. Jesus himself felt it. God understands sorrow. He's, he's been there. In fact, the Bible said this of Jesus, that he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. He, your God knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to suffer. The shortest passage in your Bible happened when Jesus found out one of his close friends had passed away, Lazarus. Two words, Jesus wept. He lost something. It was gone. And some of us have lost something in this season. I don't know what that is. For, for, for me, if I'm just being transparent with you, the last few days, the last week, has been some of the harder ones for me because I've been trying to deal with the, the, the loss of the interaction and the people I get to care for, love, and serve, and lead. And I want it back. Selfishly, I want it back. Right, I want it back yesterday. I know I don't get to have that. But we've got to be careful in our place of sorrow's okay. Sorrow's a normal feeling. As long as we don't let it overwhelm us. As long as we don't let it overwhelm us. <laughs> David understood how to deal with this. He said, God, would you listen to my cry? Would you hear my prayer? From the ends of the earth, I cry to you to help when my heart is overwhelmed. He understood if my heart's overwhelmed, it's getting dangerous. It's going too far. Sorrow's okay. It's a normal emotion. But when sorrow overwhelms you, it can become trouble. So lead me. Lead me, God, out of my sorrow and to the towering rock of safety for you. You, God, you're the rock. Are my safe refuge. Shock, sorrow, and if, if we stay there, if we can't figure out how to get out of it, our sorrow will lead us to a place where we begin to struggle. We'll begin to make some choices we wish we could undo. We'll go back to some old habits. We'll start developing some, some coping mechanisms. All of us have them. I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is. Some of us will start visiting the refrigerator or the pantry a little more often than we should. Some of us will start visiting some websites we shouldn't visit. Some of us will turn to alcohol or a substance. Some of us will sit and binge watch something on Netflix for hours and hours and hours just so our mind will feel numb. You're, you're, you're struggling. And what you begin to do is you ruminate. You just, you let your problems play over and over and over in your mind. And it can affect our relationship with God because we, we get stuck in the place of asking why. Some of the greatest spiritual leaders in your Bible, some of the heroes of the faith, some of the prophets who knew what God was going to do, they had prophesied it, they had seen the future, would still have moments where they would struggle, like Jeremiah who said, why God, why was I even born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, 
sorrow and shame. And if you read the story of Jeremiah, that's not even true. It's not even true. But when we struggle, we begin to embrace things that aren't true and we hold on to them as if they were. Some of us are struggling right now and we're asking the question why, and it's okay to ask why. Even Jesus did it as he hung on the cross giving his life for us. My God, my God, why? Why has it got to go this way? And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll get stuck here, ruminating, repeating over and over. Look, here's what rumination is. It is the focused attention on the symptoms of your distress rather than the solution. And so here's what I've got to do for you today. I've got to help you get your mind off of the symptoms and pointed to the solution. I've got to help you understand how do I build something so that I can stay emotionally solid and healthy in the new normal. My wife and I one time had the opportunity when we lived in Florida to purchase a house in a brand new neighborhood. It was really fun. I remember going in to meet with the salesperson and we got to pick out the carpet color and the countertops and the paint and the colors of the wood and the elevation and would the doorways be squared or would they be arched and would it have a fireplace or not? It was fun. It was a lot of fun for us. But, but you know, what's interesting is when they started building that house, it didn't look pretty. There were different layers. There were different pieces to the house. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. It's not just home improvement to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words that you can build a life on. And so here's where we're going to wrap up the message. So I want to give you the pieces to build some emotional stability, some emotional health on in the new normal. Norm normally what I would want to do is I'd want to get you in a small group and we'd talk about it and we'd work on it. We can't, at least for a little while longer, we can't do that. So I've got to try to give you the tools so that you can, you can build the foundation. You can, you can frame up on top of that. And eventually you get all the nice stuff on the outside, everything that makes it look pretty and beautiful. And that's what I want you to get in your soul. That's what I want your soul to look like. Jesus goes on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Coronavirus came. It poured down. Economic hardship came. <laughs> it poured down. The river flooded. The tornado hit. But nothing. I would like it if you would say that at home where you're watching right now. Nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. So let me help you frame it up. Here we go. Here's where you start. Number one, you got to start with the foundation of relationships and connectedness. And that's harder right now than it's ever been. So it requires some intentionality on our part. Remember part one of the vision we believe God has for every person is to know God, to have a relationship and a connection to God. And I, I, I just, I think in this season we're in right, in the new normal, this takes a little more intentionality. My prayer time honestly is a little longer lately. God, I just need a little more. I just need a little more time with God. And you probably do too. I have to be a little bit more intentional about my relationships, my connections, my friendships, because it's not happening as easy as it did for a while. And so we've got to work on it. We've got to be intentional with it. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to find a way to connect with God and others every day. Every day, you need to figure out, how am I going to connect with God today? I think you should, at the very least, try to get five minutes where you just sit and have a conversation with God. It'd be better if you'd try to get to 15. Not because it's a religious checklist. I'm just telling you, you probably need at least that much time to just get everything out that you need to share with him and then give him space to speak to you. Which, by the way, that's when the good stuff happens. When you stop talking and you start letting him talk. And you spend some time in his word. We've got to connect with God and others every day. Finally, brothers, Paul says to the church at Philippi and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, I'm going to think about those things. I'm not going to sit and ruminate in my problems. I'm going to get connected to God. I'm going to get his mind. I'm going to get his word inside of me. And that's what I'm going to focus on. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And the God of peace. I got so convicted as I was reading this, preparing this message for you. Because I, I got busted on this just the other day by my own wife. She said, hey, you, you're negative Nancy right now. You need to knock it off. And I, I thought, no, I'm not. You need to leave me alone. And then I read this passage and the Holy Spirit said, yes, you are. And so we need, we need the God of peace to be with us. Look at Ephesians 4.16. From him, the whole body. So I need to be connected to God. I need my relationship with God. I also need the body, people. I got to send some texts. I got to make some phone calls. I know, I know everybody's tired of Zoom. I'm tired of Zoom. But at least I get your face on Zoom. At least I get something. At least I get some sort of connection. And so every day I've got to stay, find a way to be intentional about staying connected to the body. We're joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And it helps us grow and, and it builds, it's the body of Christ, builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So you've got to do your work. You've got to make the phone call. You've got to show up for the Zoom small group. You've got to send the text. You've got to let somebody know when you're hurting and you need prayer. That's the work. You've got to do the work because if you don't do the work, the body can't grow. And if the body doesn't grow, the body doesn't take care of itself. I hope you're amening in your living room right now. I'm feeling a little more preachy on this message than I ever have been because I got to walk into this building and hear music, just having that happen, just music playing and seeing people on the stage and people behind cameras, something inside of me just kind of stood up and, and I was reminded there's, there's something bigger that we get to be a part of. There's a body that we're connected to. Here's the second thing you need. After the foundation, you got to start to build the structure of purpose and routines. You need some purpose and routines. You need to get up out of bed. I was, I, there's a radio commercial I keep hearing on the radio that's like, we all waited, we all wanted the day where we could just work in our sweats. No, don't. You gotta have some purpose and some routine. Even though you can, it doesn't mean you should. And health in the new normal requires some routine. Amanda and I tried to talk, this, talk about this with you on Mother's Day especially families with kids, you gotta have some routine right now. And if your routine's been thrown off, then you gotta make a new one. But I lost my job and I can't, normally I'd get up and I would have my coffee and I'd go to work and I'd do my work thing and that's been taken away from me right now. Hey, listen, build your routine around your calling. Figure out what God wants to do in your life in this season and then build routines around that. Don't make it about work. Compensation and calling are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Don't get the two confused. That's why I love this passage, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans, the plans. God doesn't have random chance laid out for you. He has a plan laid out for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You need that. We all need, people in our country need that right now. They need some vision. They need to see that there's a way for things to get better. A lot of people right now are hungry for things to get better around the areas of justice and, and equality. And you want to know why a lot of people are hurting right now? Because they can't see a way that it's going to get better. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision. If I can't see how things are going to get better, if I can't see how I'm going to grow, if I can't figure out what my purpose is, then I just die on the inside. You wanna know why people are doing some crazy things, making some crazy decisions right now? Here's the same passage in the NIV, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. You gotta, you gotta have something to build your life around, something to propel you forward. How do I do that, Michael? Well, It'd be easier if we get life track online for you, but you can, you can still figure it out right now. You know what you really need to do? You need to figure out what your purpose is and make a difference. Just somehow, make a difference. 
Figure out how you're going to keep your life from becoming about yourself and your own pain and how you're going to serve someone else. Discover your purpose and make a difference. And here's the last one. It's the beautifying. Now, now the, the foundation's laid and the structure's gone up. Now the outside of the house begins to come together and the landscaping goes in place and the siding goes on and the paint and the touch-ups are done. And it's, what that is, is it's the beautifying of trust and self-control. And when I trust God and I know he's for me, then I don't have to, I don't have to go back to my old ways. I don't have to fall into old patterns. I can have some self-control because I know that God, God's got this. He's still in charge. He's still looking out for me. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord. I wish you'd say that at home. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Can I just get after some of you right now? So many of us think we understand everything that's going on right now. I'm amazed at how many people in our church are suddenly medical experts and virology experts. And you're all over social media preaching your understanding. Stop. Just stop. No matter what side of the issue you're on, stop. Don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. God, what do you want? Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. He'll beautify it. He'll finish it. And make it, look, make it look the way he wanted it to all along. A lot of us are familiar with this, and here's where we're going to end with. Some of us have it hanging in our house. Many of us have shared social media posts that have it. But most of us have never read the whole thing. There's a thing called the serenity prayer, and you'll probably be familiar with the first couple lines. as It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Now that's, that's, that's the most most of us have ever seen of this prayer. It's written by a man named Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr, I think I'm pronouncing that right. But look, he goes on. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. So I can't get to peace until I get through the hard part. But hey y'all, peace is coming. This isn't gonna last forever. The new normal is gonna get replaced by another new normal. Hopefully that one will look a little more like the old normal. I hope that's not confusing for you. So I'm gonna accept that as a pathway to peace, taking, just like Jesus did, this world, this sinful world, as it is, not as I would like it to be. Trusting God that you're gonna make all things right if I'll surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life most importantly, supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. I'd, like, I'd love it if wherever you're at, you just close your eyes for a moment. And I want to talk to those of you who would start by saying, hey, Michael, I don't know God. I'm not connected. I don't have the foundation. I'm not connected with him. Well, hey, listen, that can change right now. You can just pray a simple prayer. And what I'd love is if you would pray this prayer and then in our chat there, if you're watching Church Online, click the button that says, I'm raising my hand. If you're watching on YouTube or social media, send us a message or head over to our website. Fill out the digital connection card. Let us know that you're making a decision today to start at the foundation level and begin a relationship with God. And right there where you're at, you can just repeat after me and just say, Jesus, today I want to surrender my life to you. I'm sorry all the days I've spent doing life my own way. But from this day on, my life belongs to you. Please save me. Change me. Give me a foundation of relationship with you that I can begin to build a new life on. And thank you that because of this moment, this prayer, this decision, one day I will spend eternity with you. It'll be a supremely happy life. In Jesus' name. Stay in a moment of prayer if you're wherever you're watching right now. And I just wanna I just wanna ask you how, how are you doing emotionally? Do you have the structure? Do you have the foundation? Are you being intentional with your connections? How are you doing with the 
the structure of rhythm and routine and are you getting away to spend time with God? Are you, are you having some meaningful conversations with people who are, encourage you and push you towards Jesus? How are you doing at trusting him? Leaning on him instead of trying to figure it all out and fix it all on your own. Can I pray for you today that all of us would get a little better in those areas? Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person who's watching church online right now. Some of us are dealing with shock. Some of us are stuck in a place of sorrow. Many of us, many of us are struggling. And God, the things we would normally do to get ourselves healthy again, those don't work right now. It's a new normal. So I pray that you would help us. God, help us to get intentional about connecting with you and connecting with people every day. That's our foundation. Help us to do that, God. Help us to build that structure of healthy routine. And, and God, help us ultimately to put our hope and our trust completely in you so that we can have an emotionally strong, healthy soul. God, help us not to just focus on saving the body. Help us to focus on saving the soul. And I thank you for the work that you're going to do in the life of each and every person as we surrender to you in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for watching Church Online today. Can't wait to catch up with you next week for part three of the new normal. God bless you. All right, everybody, I hope that message spoke to you today. I hope it resonated in your heart. I hope you're thinking about right now how to make sure we keep our soul healthy. I think that would really help with a lot of the pain that so many people are experiencing right now. There's so much of it. There's so much pain in our world. There's so much pain in our country right now. And it breaks my heart, and I believe it breaks the heart of God. There's so much division in our country around politics and policies and agendas. And right now at the forefront of all of that is division around race and the color of skin. And I just got to tell you, that is not God's heart. The Bible makes clear over and over and over again that, that God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't have preferential treatment. That we are all his kids. That we all come from him. And he loves all of us equally and he loves justice and he wants justice for all of us. So I know some of you are wondering, what is the church's role right now? How, how do we respond in a time like this? Is it just that we go make social media posts and, and, and try to set, talk about how we're feeling? And, and so I've just got a couple thoughts for you, and I want to start by giving you a resource that I hope you'll use to just kind of get the wheels turning in your mind and your heart. One of our overseers, Pastor David Branker, who serves as the chief of staff at One Hope, one of the missions organizations we work with, that is spreading the gospel around the globe through your generosity. He's, he's African American and wrote a beautiful blog that I think will help you. It'll, it'll help you think and pray through what's going on in our country right now. And we're posting the link to that in our live chat and on our social media channels right now as you're watching the service. Click it, bookmark it. When you have a couple minutes, take some time and read through that. We're also gonna take time next Sunday and we're going to hit pause on the content in this New Normal series. And I've reached out to Pastor Miles McPherson, who's a former NFL football player and the pastor of the Rock Church in San Diego, California. He also happens to be African American and speaks on the issue of race and injustice and reconciliation and equality from a biblical perspective better than anyone I've ever heard in my entire life. And I asked them, can we use Pastor Miles' message on this topic and share it with our church? And they said, absolutely yes. So next weekend, you'll, you'll get to hear from one of the most influential leaders in the world in Pastor Miles McPherson as we talk about this topic. And here's what I want you to think about this week. I had a conversation with one of my neighbors recently. His name is Bernard, and my wife and I love him deeply. Some of you met him on Serve Day last year. And... Uh, Bernard is a person of color. He's African-American. And um, I was talking to him about what was going on. I was just saying, hey, man, are you doing okay? Like, how are you? And he said, you know, I, I was outraged at first. 
now I just, I don't really know. I don't know what to think. I think you can add more laws. You can, you can train. But it won't necessarily stop this from happening again. And he and I agreed that the reason for that is because you cannot train what's in someone's heart. You cannot legislate what's in someone's heart. The only way a heart change takes place is to have a supernatural encounter with Jesus. And man, does our country ever need that right now. We need Jesus. And so I want to encourage you this week to lean into that. I want to encourage you this week to lean into your relationship with Jesus. I want to encourage you this week to lean into your relationships. And maybe before you just share an opinion or a social media post, maybe stop and think, who could I call? Who could I show love to? Who could I serve? Who could I pray for? In fact, on July 11th, Serve Day is coming up, and we're still going to do it, y'all. Even in the middle of the pandemic, we're going to find a way to serve our community and find a way to serve people in need. And I need your help. If there's a serving project you're aware of or someone in need that you're aware of, I need you to go to truelife.church forward slash serve team, fill out the form there, and let us know what needs you're aware of so that we can step in and serve people who have them. I want you to make some phone calls this week, and I want you to lean into God's Word this week. You know, His Word has a lot to say about how human beings should treat each other and care for each other. Most importantly, I want you to pray. Prayer is the most powerful weapon we have. It's the most powerful tool we have. And if there has ever been a time that our country needs prayer, if there's ever been a time that our country needs our Heavenly Father to step in and intercede and bring healing and hope and restoration, it's right now. So here's how we're going to end our time together today. We're going to play a song for you. It was written a couple years ago by a worship team at a church that we know and love, River Valley in Minnesota, where all of this that's happening right now where George Floyd lost his life. And they wrote a worship song and recorded a worship song called The World, World Needs Jesus. And here's what I want to ask you to do. We're just going to play that song as we end our time together today. You can sing along with it if you want. You could have a worship moment if you want. Maybe it would be a good time to really focus in. Maybe you want to kneel down there at your side of your bed or at your table or your sofa or wherever it is in your house. Ask the Holy Spirit, is there, any, is there anything in my heart you want to deal with? Is there, any, is there any bias? Is there any prejudice in me? Holy Spirit, expose it. Teach me how to deal with it. Show me how you can use my life to bring healing and hope and restoration to a world that needs it desperately. We're going to play the song. It's your time. But I want to ask you to stick around for the, the whole song Listen to the words, listen to the message, and let's go to God on behalf of the people we love, the people we know, and even the ones we don't. So our world desperately needs Jesus. When our homes are hit by heartbreak, let your presence meet us there When the pain seems overwhelming We hold on to you When the streets are torn by chaos We will be your hands and darkness brings division may we be your light cause we know our world needs Jesus we know that our world needs freedom so give us eyes to see the hurting and the broken let our lives align with every word you say When the nations ache from violence We will be your blessed face When the headlines
Jesus 